welcome to ATCM, the emergency medicine channel. So today uh, we will discuss regarding advanced trauma life support and in that we will briefly discuss what do you mean by primary and secondary service. So whenever we discuss regarding a trauma uh, patient, we always say that we have to do it as per the uh, indicate as per the guidelines set by the advanced trauma life support. So as you all are aware, we are currently uh, going through the 10th edition. So this is basically a guidelines formed by the American College of Surgeons. So they have made a certain guidelines. What all things you need to do when a patient presents you with trauma. So we'll just briefly discuss about advanced trauma life support. In that we will discuss regarding primary survey and secondary survey. So coming to primary survey and secondary survey. First of all, when a patient comes with trauma to you, this is a complex and a high risk environment. So that is the first thing that you need to understand. So uh, we can have a lot of issues when handling a trauma patient. We always see and there can be prevents of breakdowns of plants. So we have decided something and suddenly that is not going to happen. You can easily miss injury. So our aim is to prevent that miss injury. So we need to prevent this miss injuries. And the most important one is here. It is a teamwork. So as a single person, you cannot run a code in trauma. You need, as you know, any code, you need multiple persons. So you need to have a proper teamwork. So in your team, each team member should have a definitive role. So that is the most ideal thing that you need to have a teamwork in any resuscitation for that matter. And there should be always a team leader. So team leader should be the person who is giving the commands and you should be coordinating the things with the other members in the team. So he should not boss the group, but he should be giving suggestions and he should be documenting. Somebody need to take the lead when you are having a patient with polytrauma. So that will be the role of a team leader. And most importantly, it should be a closed loop communication. Closed loop communication means suppose I'm going to give a drug order. I need to give a clear instruction. That is very important. So you have to give a clear instruction. So suppose I want to give normal saline bolus. I'm, I cannot just say that give normal saline bolus. That should not be my order. Give 500 ml of normal saline, IV bolus over 10 to 15 minutes. That should be my order. And the next person who is listening to it, he has to listen to it and he need to give a feedback to the way, to the team leader or whoever has given that order that I have received that order and I will be implementing it. And once the person has given the bolus, he need to give that 500 ml of normal saline bolus initiated and it will be over within next 10 to 15 minutes. Then only that communication loop will close. So that is basically when by closed loop communication, you need to have all those things for all patients that you are doing resuscitation in your ED. This is very important to have a closed loop communication and your instruction should be very, very clear. So the most important part in any resuscitation for that matter is effective communication. So make sure that you are doing that effective communication. The next thing, what are the pearls of ATLS? So what we are trying to do, what we are achieving to do by doing an advanced trauma life support. We have timely treatment of the injury. So whatever injury is there, we need to timely manage it and we need to prevent further damage. So that is the timely treatment of injuries. And always we know we speak about ABCD approach. So A, B, C, D, airway, breathing, Cervical C is circulation with hemorrhage control and D and E exposure. We will discuss that in detail and treat the greatest threat to the life first. So that is life threatening injuries is the first priority. So whichever is the life threatening injuries, we need to treat that first. So life threatening injuries will be our priority. So repeat airway breathing circulation assessment when patient deteriorates. So frequent reassessment is very, very important when you are dealing with a patient with trauma and resuscitation is done simultaneously. So you can have two things. You can do a survey like this, but what we usually does, we does everything. The, when we write it down, it will be A, B, C, D and E, but we will always does a survey parallelly. That means one person will be taking care of the airway, one person will be taking care of the B, C, D and E. It is not like after A, one will go to B, after C, D, E. It is not like that. Usually what we practice, one person will take care of airway and the team member can start simultaneously take care of a horizontal. Rather than having a horizontal, we can have a parallel survey. Immediately you can go ahead and start looking for the A, B, C, D assessment. And resuscitation is always done simultaneously. So, of course, you find a problem in B, you need to correct it then and there itself. So, that is the most important thing that you have to understand. And the, the, the lack of a definitive diagnosis should never be treated. We are not going to look what is the treat, what is the diagnosis that is going to happen. Our aim is to stabilize the airway, breathing, circulation, disability and exposure of the patient. So, that is our aim. A detailed history is not always essential, but 
sometimes uh, we need to get this history, basic history mechanisms of injury, but majority of the time we might not get the history. Maybe some pedestrian has been hit by a car, we don't know exactly what is happening, what is the medical history, all those things we might not get. So that is an another challenge that we need to have. Now, what are the priorities in ATLS? So, ATLS says, assess a patient's condition rapidly and accurately. That is the most important thing. How quickly you can assess and how appropriately or how accurately you can assess the patient's uh, uh, condition and resuscitate and, and stabilize according to the priority. As I told, the priorities of a life-threatening emergencies is our priority. So, that is the first priority that we will have. Determine whether a patient's needs exceeds the resources of a facility. Suppose you have got 15 patients coming in together. You only have a facility to gather of maybe 10 patients. So that is also very important. So you don't have resources, enough resources. You always should have a backup disaster plan for your ED. Suppose your uh, number of disaster plan, that means if your ED is better, it's only like 15 to 20 better ED. You can't receive a patient who, who more than that number. So suppose there is an RTA happened, bus versus an, another bus. There are some 50 to 60 casualties. You cannot bring them all together to your ED. So you should be clear what is the limit and always you should have a plan to do what for those group of patients, how many patients you can receive, each category wise. And also you need to take care of the existing patient. There will be already patients in the ED. So how better quickly or you can move away from your ED to another area. Suppose this patient needed to be in an ICU or in a ward. Maybe they can we move them quickly as possible or we have having a dedicated disaster area. When your hospital will have a dedicated disaster area where you can have a code yellow being called and a lot of staff members, uh, healthcare facilities will be reaching that area. So that is all depends upon your hospital system. So you should have definitely have a disaster plan. You should know how many patients you can cater also. That is again one important. So and arise appropriately for patient in the hospital or in the hospital. Suppose you don't have enough uh, beds, you need to refer into another hospital. So proper referral need to happen. Ensure that the optimal care is being given for all these patients and proper evaluation, resuscitation and transfer process has to happen. So this is one important graph that you can see here. So we have number of death and this is hours. So you can just see that immediately there is one peaking. That is immediate death. Then there is another peaking, there is an early death. Then there is a late death. So what we are trying to do in, in by doing an ATLS, there is something called as prime model distribution of death. Some death happen within seconds to minutes. You cannot do anything. On the spot, the patient might die. But there is a group of patients who will die from minutes to hours. When you are giving a proper resuscitation to them, you can prevent a death to that patient. So that second peaking is what we are trying to do. And third peaking will be after maybe after hours to days. Maybe they will drive due to complication due to related to trauma or maybe infection. All those things will be the other reason. So we should always know that there is a trinodal, trimodal distribution of death in a trauma patient. So we'll go to the next one. So life-threatening injury. So that is, as I said, our aim is to treat the life-threatening injuries. 39 percentage, you have to understand 39 percentage of trauma victim in, have injuries that are initially missed. So, however, best be the clinician, you can, you can miss 39 percentage of injuries. That will always happen. We cannot see all the injuries. Maybe the manifestation has not started. Uh, maybe after a few hours only the manifestation has started. So, we can miss that. And 22 percentage of the mark clinically significant. Among this 39 percentage, 29 percentage of the mark clinically significant. So, that is again one important thing. So, it, what does it happen? It leads to increased mortality. Additional procedures you need to do, significant pain to the patient, there can be complication and residual disability. So this 39% out of 29% are of clinical significant and if you miss, which can lead on to increased mortality, additional procedures might be needed to the patient. So these are the most important things that you can miss. We, can, we, are not, uh, we cannot say every patient I, I found out this injury, we can miss. That's always a possibility. But our focus, as I always say, it is on life-threatening problems and minimize the risk of missed injuries. So that should be our aim. We should not be missing a life-threatening injuries and as well as we should not miss one major injury that can lead to death of the patient. So what are the preparations that is needed? You can have a pre-hospital and an in-hospital preparation. So just in the pre-hospital setting, we have to make sure that the airway has been maintained. When you are your pre-hospital paramedic is going on, they make sure that the airway is maintained. Control of external bleeding of shock, very important again. Immobilization of the patient, proper splinting needed, depending upon splinting is very important. Cervical spine immobilization, splinting. Then communication with the hospital. As I said, 
resources. What is your available resources? How many patients you can take in? All those things should be clearly communicated with the hospital and transport to the closest approximate facility. So if you have nearby facility where you can transfer, where there is available, you need to transport to the closest appropriate facility. If possible, get the history. If you are not able to get the history, we cannot do anything. So this will be the pre-hospital requirement. Once the in-hospital, you should have an advanced planning, especially as I told, in a massive casualty or a disaster. You can have multiple casualty or you can have disaster, a uh, disaster, huge disaster that is coming to. Multiple casualty also can be seen. Then you always make sure that you are having standard proportion, equipment available and personal. As I said, code yellow is what we use in our hospital. Uh, for uh, saying that there is an external disaster. So this will be the basic trauma management of food. We should have a proper preparation, primary survey for all victims that is coming with trauma. We will discuss that in detail. And we need to do simultaneous resuscitation and any adjuncts to the resuscitations like taking a chest x-ray and doing a focus assessment sonography in trauma. And always, always remember the evaluation. So once we are doing one re evaluation, that is not enough. We need to continuously do re-evaluation of this victim also. Now, once we are done with the primary survey, resuscitation and adjuncts, and they are stable enough, you can go for a detailed secondary assessment. <laughs> for example, you need to do a CT brain play. You can do in a, after having a detailed secondary evaluation, where we does our, uh, basically the re-evaluation, head to do examination, where we take a sample history and we have to always do head with the adjuncts. So that is the next thing that you need to have, that is the detailed Secondary survey, again re-evaluation and definitely care. So this is, will be a nutshell regarding the workflow that you need to do for a patient with trauma. Now we go, what we are saying about primary survey I said regarding A. We always know that's A, but in trauma, A is airway with cervical spine involved protection. So that is very, very important. So A is cervical airway with C-spine protection, not just clearing the airway is not sufficient in a trauma victim. Air with, with C-spine protection. B is for breathing and ventilation. C is circulation with hemorrhage control. Suppose you have a large external hemorrhage that you are able to see. You do that hemorrhage control. You cannot just fix the, uh, give the, just give the <coughs> fluids that is not enough. We need to stop the bleeding also. And disability, neurological status, your GCS. And exposure and environment control. You need to prevent hypothermia. Because you know the triad of death. That is very important, the triad of death. In a trauma patient, is three things. One is coagulopathy. Coagulopathy. So you can't afford to have a coagulopathy. Then you can have hypothermia. So hypothermia is very important. Hypothermia. You need to avoid hypothermia. So that is how environmental control and exposure is involved. And you need to avoid acidosis. Suppose you are pumping a lot of IV fluids. So the patient can go for hyperchloremic acidosis. So coagulopathy, acidosis and hypothermia this is a triad of blood so you cannot have this in a patient with trauma so you need to be very very clear you need to avoid triangulopathy you need to prevent hypothermia and acidosis so that is the uh, regarding your primary survey now coming to 10 second survey see the patient you are receiving immediately you can quickly do a 10 second survey you can just see that airway breathing circulation is fine so that is what is called as a 10 second survey so you need can have a detailed abcd approach but before that we can have a simple 10 second survey which is an easy way to assess patient in 10 seconds. Ask the patient his or her name. If he is able to say that, then that means the airway and breathing is fine and circulation to some extent is okay. Because the brain is perfusing well, he is able to understand what you have asked and the patient is able to give you a clear answer. So you can again ask the patient what happened exactly. So if he is able to give you back an answer, that means A, B, C is presently at present okay, but we are not very sure to First impression, the patient looks okay. So that is the only thing that we can see by uh, asking for the patient's name or what exactly happened. So what does it say? A patient airway, sufficient air reserve to permit speech, sufficient perfusion and clear sensorium. So if you have, the patient is able to say these things clearly, these are a quick assessment for your A, B, C, D. So A, B, C, D can be quickly assessed by using this method that is called as a 10 second survey. So now coming to the first thing, airway with cervical spine stabilization. So that is as I told, A stands for airway with cervical spine. So make sure that establish a patent airway and protect the C-spine. Suppose the airway is not patent, you need to do a simple maneuvers like jaw thrust maneuver or a head tilt. But 
usually what is the problem in head tilt when you are having a cervical spine injury when doing a head tilt there is a high risk that the patient can have further damage to the cervical spine so head tilt manoeuvre should be avoided in a patient who are suspecting have a cervical spine injury so what you can do instead of you can do a jaw thrust maybe chin lift to some extent there is no issue jaw thrust and chin lift manoeuvre when we you can look, do for suction but again most important thing is that putting a right stoop or an air overall airway and nasopharyngeal airway there will be challenges whenever you are suspecting a base of skull fracture at that time you cannot put a nasal airway because there is a high chance that base of skull fracture can be there this can cause further damage so you have to be very clear you have to rule out a base of skull fracture before putting an oral or a nasopharyngeal airway or maybe a right stoop also so establishing a patent airway with protecting the c-spine is our goal Assume C spine injury in patients with multisystem trauma. Unless otherwise proven, if the patient is being brought in with a polytrauma, just make sure that they are having a proper C spine protector. You have to assume that they are having a C spine injury. There is no doubt they are having a C spine injury. And you can clear the C spine. We will see how will we clear the C spine. And also, you verify the placement of the cervical collar. If the cervical collar is placed properly and always, always, as I say, reassess. So, airway can be painted at this moment, but after Maybe five minutes, the patient can have a problem with the airway. So airway, breathing, circulation, every time you need to reassess. So now what we dealt is airway with cervical spine stabilization. So now what are the airway interventions that you need? As I said, you need to just supplemental oxygen. You are just looking at the saturation. The saturation is on the lower side. You can start with just with supplemental oxygen. As a note, you can have options of NRBM, that is not rebreathing mask where you can achieve an FAO2 of 80 to 100 percentage when you are giving an oxygen flow more than 12 liters per minute. So that is one option. So you can have NRBM, you can have normal Hudson mask, Hudson mask that is a normal face mask where you can give 5 to 10 liters of oxygen. So this will be the usual two preferred option for oxygen supplementation. Then you need to have suctioning. You can need to have an oral suctioning, maybe a nasal suctioning depending upon where exactly the bleeding is there. So suction is the next important uh, airway maneuver that you need to over. And chin lift and jaw thrust, I already mentioned, avoid head tail, oral and nasal airways. We have contraindications, we have already discussed. And definitely airways, RSI for agitation patient with C collar. So we have to go for rapid sequence intubation when you have to secure a definitely airway. So sometimes you need to go ahead with the surgical airway also. Sometimes you are unable to intubate and ventilate. You can just need to go ahead with the surgical airway, like crocodilotomy, needle or uh, uh, surgical crocodilotomy, or maybe a tracheostomy. So that is for your definitely airway management. Just to clarify, what do you mean by definitely airway? Definitely airway is nothing but a cuffed tube, a cuffed tube inside the trachea. So that is what you meant by a cuffed tube inside the trachea. We can call it as a definite airway. So you can have endotracheal tube, ET tube, or you can have the surgical airway tubes like tracheostomy or any of these things. So that is basically uh, definite airway. And endotracheal intubation is again done for comatose patients who have GCS of less than A. That is in order to protect their airway reflexes always prepared. So that is again must for all the EDs. You have to be prepared for your worst scenario. Now, there are a lot of uh, C-spine stabilization methods. What we have, uh, we can look into is two criteria. One is a standard one is called as Nexus criteria. So that is a very pretty easy one, Nexus criteria. And you can have a Canadian C-spine rule. So we'll just go through what are the two rules for Canadian C-spine rule. So it is pretty simple. So Nexus criteria is very, very easy. You have just have five criteria that you need to look in for. No posterior, if the patient don't have any posterior cervical like that, so that is the first thing. There is no evidence of intoxication, a normal or a normal level of alertness, no focal neurological deficit, no painful distracting injury. So what do you mean by exactly painful distracting injury? Suppose this patient is having an open femur fracture. Imagine that the pain will be very much excruciating of that limb and he might not be feeling the pain of the cervical spine injury. So if the patient has got any one of this, we need to put a cervical immobilization to this patient. So what will be the method? You need to have a cervical immobilization. So that is basically what is called as the nexus criteria. So that is a simple one that you can use in your ED. So any of these things are there, definitely that patient need to have a cervical immobilization. So if the patient don't have a posterior midline cervical tenderness, no evidence of intoxication, a normal level of consciousness, no focal neurological deficit, no painful distracting injuries, then there is no 
need of a cervical spine imaging that is how it came up but what i am saying is that if it's not the you can just clear off the cervical spine that is one criteria by which you can use that is nexus criteria then you have something called as canadian c spine rule which is little bit more uh, not complicated but when you go through the flowchart it is very easy so any patient that is coming to your trauma if the patient has any of these risk factors age more than 65 years dangerous mechanism so what do you mean by a dangerous mechanism of injury so they have already mentioned what is a dangerous mechanism so fall from elevation height more than five stairs or three feet what you can just quickly remember more than the height of the patient suppose the patient is five seven more than the height of the patient axial load to head suddenly uh, the patient has been diving into the sea and suddenly his head has gone and hit the floor so that is axial load to the head motor vehicle high speed more than high kilometer per hour roll over ejection from the vehicle motorized recreational vehicles like an ATV, that is the uh, automated that uh, racing vehicles, bicycle collision with an object, post and car. So these are all examples of a dangerous mechanism. And uh, when you have a dangerous mechanism of injury and there is a number of degree in an extremity, yes, you need to make sure that this patient might have a cervical spine injury and you need to have a C-spine mobilization. So first three criteria, age more than 65, dangerous mechanism. I have explained what is dangerous mechanism. And numbers of tingling in extremities, you need to have a C-spine immobilization. If the patient doesn't have any of this, then you can go to the next one. That is a simple rear and motor vehicle collision. Simple rear and motor vehicle collision is just a hit. What is it? excludes a push into oncoming traffic, hit by a bus or large truck, roll over, hit by high speed. These are all not examples of simple rear and motor vehicle collision. But rest all is a simple rear and motor vehicle collision. Ambulatory at time of scene. So after the accident, the patient is able to walk. No neck pain at scene. When the patient is being asked, there is having a neck pain. Again, uh, you can rule out that this patient is probably not having a cervical spine injury and no pain during midline cervical impalpation. Then there is no need of uh, cervical spine mobilization. If the patient has any of this, you need to have a cervical spine mobilization. And when the patient comes to the ED, you need patient voluntarily able to uh, rotate to 45 degrees. You can ask the patient to rotate voluntarily 45 degrees. If the patient is able to do that, then there is no need of cervical spine injury. So it's basically a mechanism by which we are going for a high mechanism from a low, uh, dangerous, less dangerous mechanism. So that is the Canadian C rule. So you can have Nexus criteria or Canadian rule, whichever you are uh, comfortable with, you can use in your ED for cervical spine immobilization. So now, what is the question is, what is meant by manual inline stabilization? So there is a lot of people, we just say cervical immobilization. So we don't say how to immobilize that. That is again very important. So these are the pictorial representation of doing a manual inline stabilization. So first image you see, kneel behind the patient and place your hand firmly around the base of the skull on the either side. So this is the pictorial representation. This is the hand position. Make sure that your hands are placed like this. And next, Support the lower jaw with your index and long fingers. Suppose support the lower jaw with your index and the long fingers and the head with your palm. Head with your palm. Gently lift the head into a neutral position. Eye forward. Eye forward position aligned with the torso. It should be aligned with the torso and do not move the head or neck excessively. So this is what is simple manual realized stabilization. So work to stand, kneel behind the patient. Support the lower jaw. This is the lower jaw. Support the lower jaw with your index and the long finger and the head with your palms. Gently lift the head into a neutral position where the eyes are looking forward position and it should be aligned with the torso. So that is simple manual inline stabilization. So suppose you are planning to intubate a patient. You want to do a manual inline stabilization. You need to do this way and the person who is intubating can do the intubation and the person who is holding the cervical spine can sit down on the floor and do this procedure. So that is manual inline stabilization which is very important. You need to do the right way. This is the right way by which you need to do this. Now these are the seat collars that is available commercially. The most commonly what we see something called as a Philadelphia collar and you can have something called as a universal collar. You can just see you can have the adjustment of the size of the collar. So depending upon the patient's neck length, you can adjust the size of the C collar. So that is called as a universal collar, no soft collar in a cervical spine injury. You can use either Philadelphia collar, which is this one, or you can use a universal collar, something like this, where you can adjust the height uh, of the collar depending upon the patient's neck length. 
Now the next question, how to select the size of a column? That is again many of them doesn't know. So it's pretty simple. When you are doing that manual relay stabilization, one person can just put a hand underneath the mandible and just measure the length from here to here by using your finger and you just go and place the finger on the cervical collar, universal collar and you measure the size and you fix it there and that should be the adjustment that need to be done in this universal, in this universal, sorry, in this universal collar. So you can adjust, you can see steps of adjustment they are put in here. So you measure it with using your hand. Suppose the patient, suppose the patient is here. Suppose the patient is here, you measure the distance using your hand and you need to fix that to the uh, universal collar and fix it. Now application. So there is two methods by which you can apply a, a cervical collar. One is posterior first method. I prefer doing a posterior first method. It is pretty easy. While one provider applies inline stabilization. So one provider is just taking care of inline stabilization, whichever be the way we have discussed. Slide the posterior portion of the collar behind the patient's neck. So the posterior part of the collar is this one. Behind the patient neck, you slowly slide it down and maintain inline stabilization. The patient should not walk. Whoever is doing the inline stabilization should stay with the patient. Maintain inline stabilization in neutral position until the patient is fully mobilized. Then what you need to do, bring the front portion of the collar around under the patient's chin. Ensure that the chin is well supported by the chin piece. Difficulty positioning the chin piece may indicate that need for a shorter collar. Maybe you are not done your measurement right, then you can have a problem. Then attach the loop velcro from the uh, from the posterior portion of the collar to the hook velcro on the anterior portion and recheck for the patient's head for proper alignment. That is again very important. Tighten the cloth as needed until proper support is obtained. Once the proper support is obtained, you can ask this patient to remove this hand. So this hands can be removed after proper stabilization. So that is the posterior first method. And in a first method, again it is simple, but while in inline stabilization, the pro in provider, the position, the chin piece under the patient's chin. So this is the chin piece, what you are seeing here is the chin piece. Patient's head you have placed, slide the posterior portion of the collar behind the patient neck. Make sure that the inline stabilization is being continued and secure the collar posteriorly and assess for proper placement as described. So you can do either way, but what I prefer is posterior first method. That's what we routinely we practice in our reading. So this is a method by which you need to have an uh, cervical immobilization. Now coming to the next thing, log roll maneuver. Again, we say log rolling, but we are not exactly doing what is to be done. So I'm just briefly explaining how to do a log rolling of the patient. So position one rescuer at the patient head. That is again very important to apply manual relay stabilization. But if the patient is already having a cervical collar, just the person can support the head. So that is the only thing that is needed. And position, you need minimum three people. You can just see here to hold the patient and one person to slide in the board also. So the one, person one, we can call him person one, person two, person three. And there's another person is the patient four. If available, you can slide in or this person can just push the spine board on a command of one, two and three. So position the backbone next to the patient's body. Note that the lateral leg stabilizer has been pre-applied to the board. So this is the Next, lateral neck stabilizer. Suppose the patient is on the board, you need to have some protection for this also because the head should not be moving again. So you need to have blocks like this also. So that should be fixed priorly itself. So these are again velcro tapes. What you are seeing here is the velcro tapes for the head blocks. So what you have to do? You have to one person doing the inline stabilization. One, two and three. On a command of one, two and three, one person should be holding the head and the second person what he should do? He can keep his hand over the shoulder and over the hip here. Then the other person can use his hand just above this patient's hip. So suppose this is the hand of the, uh, the rescuer too. And you can just place your hand here. Then other person over the knee joint. And one person can give a command of, suppose the person on the headset can give a one, two and three. You need to move in patient to your side and this patient can remove the support from the knee joint and you can just push the cervical collar and put the patient onto the board. So that is one method. Suppose you have an additional hair, the other person can just push in the board. That is also okay. When the rescuer at the patient, head gives the command, roll the patient onto his side, examine the patient's back. Suppose you have not done back examination, you can do. Suppose there is any spinal tenderness, anything is there. 
you can examine at this point of time and slide the backboard under the patient and roll the patient back onto the board when the head rescuer gives the command center the patient on the board before applying the strap suppose you are before these are the straps that you are seeing here before applying the straps you have to make sure that the patient is being centered and after the strap is placed apply a lateral neck stabilizer this is the velcro that i said and in the further this is one ferno universal immobilizer so you can just fix the head block and again you can approach the fix the uh, cervical spine and the head will not move laterally so this is the ideal method of doing a full body spine board with a low ground because the patient has already been on a c-spine it, it was much more easier now again one more difficulty that we might face is removal of a helmet suppose the patient is already having a helmet how to remove it you just pull away the helmet so that is not correctly to be done that should be done properly so what do you have to do so one person you see here can slide the hand inside and spread the helmet to the clear the ears and can slide the hand inside and he can stabilize the neck so that is the one person doing and other person what he can do he can just slowly by clearing just slowly by small tilting motion he can take away the helmet and once the helmet is taken away the person who has removed the helmet can do the manual inline stabilization so that should be the right method so you remove the chin strap make sure that the chin strap is removed one patient slides in hands inside the helmet and support the uh, cervical spine near the ears and the person behind will slowly in a slowly tilting motion slowly very slowly removes the helmet and he will take over the cervical immobilization this is another device which i have not used or seen this is the eject helmet removal system from simpson that is a pictorial representation we need to just uh, have to put the system and maybe just need to squeeze the air something and the helmet will automatically pop off so that is one thing which we are uh, we are not having this so just a pictorial representation of this now we have com completed the airway with cervical spine stabilization so airway a stands for airway with c-spine stabilization b for breathing and ventilation again very very important so assess adequate oxygenation as ventilation is there to the patient inspect palpate and auscultate what are the parameters that you need to look in for you need to look in for respiratory rate deviated trachea chest movement whether there is a flail chest one part of the chest is not moving whether there is a paradoxical respiration sucking chest wounds you can have an open pneumothorax that is what you have to look for absence of air entry there is no air entry or auscultation and spo2 so these are the things that you have to crucially you have to look in for whenever you are having assessing for breathing and oxygenation so respiratory oxygen status trachea position chest movement sucking any chest wounds and air entry so these are the basic things that you need to look in for now uh, what are the adjuncts that you need to look in for ventilate with 100 percent oxygen to start off with as i told you can have with an nrbm needle decompression if you are suspecting any tension pneumothorax you need to go ahead with the needle decompression so where you need to need do needle decompression there was a slide update you have to do in the fourth or fifth intercostal space intercostal space anterior to the mid axillary lamp so mid axillary lamp so that is the area where you need to do the uh, needle decompression so the same area where you do the chest tube insertion chest tube for pneumothorax and hemothorax occlusive dressing for sucking chest wound you have to have a three way adhesive bandage and if intubated evaluate the endotracheal position so this is again an x-ray that you will see here there is the whole area this whole area is black this should be the color you are able to see the lung markings here but this whole area is black so when you will call a traction pneumothorax when the patient is having pneumothorax with hypotension, we we'll call it as a tension pneumothorax. So this is again the pictorial representation where you need to put your ICD. So you see, this is the axillary fossa. You have the anterior axillary line. You have the mid axillary line. This is the mid axillary line. This is the posterior axillary line. So where you need to put is anterior to the anterior to the mid axillary side. So this will be the area where you need to put it. So nipple will be the fifth intercostal space. So this is the area where you need to go ahead and put your intercostal tube or your needle decompression for tension pneumothorax in pediatric age group it is still in the second intercostal space where you need to put the needle decompression for uh, for uh, tension pneumothorax for an adult patient it is still in, it is in the fifth or fourth or fifth intercostal space so uh, we have uh, come to this this is the open pneumothorax the occlusive dressing again very important you see this this is the underlying collapse length this is the underlying collapse length what you are able to see here and this is the three-way adhesive bandage. You see, it is only oh, 
close here, but there is an opening here. This is the opening here. So what will happen? The patient is breathing in. This will go adjacent to the skin and there is no air entering. So the air will touch this place and will go out. It will not go inside the patient leg. Well, at the time of expiration, the air will come out through this part. So that is a three-way anusive bandage what you need to use in for a patient with open pneumothorax. So that is regarding your breathing ventilation. So where to put ICD we have discussed. I have not gone depth in chest injuries. We will discuss chest injuries separately. Just I want to concentrate on ABCD approach. That's why I didn't go ahead with much on it. So now coming to circulation and hemorrhage control. Hemorrhagic shock should be assumed in any patient with high potency trauma patient. Any patient that is coming with a trauma, you have to make, you have to think that this patient is in shock. And the shock primary reason is hemorrhagic. Unless proven otherwise, the shock in a patient with trauma, primarily it is a hemorrhagic shock. Rapid assessment of hemodynamic status is what you need to do. How will you do the rapid uh, assessment of the hemodynamic status? You have to look for the level of consciousness of the patient, skin color of the patient, pulses in the fore extremity, blood pressure and pulse pressure. And also simple thing what you can do is capillary refilling time. If it is less than 2 seconds that is okay. So that means perfusion is fine at this point of time. So one thing that you can look in for is the capillary refilling time. So level of consciousness. Why it is implicating on circulation? If the level of consciousness is okay, the perfusion to the brain is fine. Skin color, again the decrease of perfusion, you will have mottling of the skin. Pulses in four extremities, if you are able to get four pulses, it is having a reasonable perfusion. That is only you can say, you cannot say that this BP is above 160. But that all depends upon your practice. Blood pressure and pulse pressure, very very important. And also we can think of mean arterial pressure. You can calculate the mean arterial pressure also. So, uh, why pulse pressure? Because pulse pressure... Narrowing of the pulse pressure will be one of the clinical findings before the patient develops hypotension. So that is regarding the circulation and hemorrhage control. And what are the interventions that you need to do? Control hemorrhage, restore volume and reassess. Cardiac monitoring, continuous monitoring of the uh, two leads or you can use the, not two leads, you can use the three leads by which you can use the rhythm. Apply pressure to site of external hemorrhage, establish IV access, very very important, two large bore IV access. So, what do you mean by large bore? Anything less than 18 gauge. 18 gauge or less than that, we can call it as a large bore IV axis. As you know, regarding the Poisley slope, as the length, length of the cannula and diameter of the cannula. So, as the diameter increases, the flow rate increases. So, diameter is more, the flow rate is more. The length is less, flow rate is more. So, if you need to have a cannula which have larger diameter than the cell. So, we need to go anything beyond, below 18 gauge. Central line only if indicator, routinely central line is not needed. IV fluid 1 liter, high potency resuscitation, you need to keep in mind what you mean by high potency or balance resuscitation. You can check on the video on balance resuscitation. Basically, high potency resuscitation, we are permitting certain amount of high potential because we don't want to Dislodge the clot, whatever has happened. Suppose this patient is having a BP of about 90 by 60 and he is having a probably a hemorrhagic shock. I don't want to pump in more fluids and maintain a BP of 180. Certain amount of hypotension, I am accepting it. So that is called as permissive hypotension. Suppose you are increasing the blood pressure, what can happen is that the clot can get dislodged and further bleeding and the trial of death can happen. So that is one thing. You can go for IV fluid, 1 liter, normal saline or renal active, whichever fluid that is okay. And center line only if needed, preferably initially we just need two large bore IV access and always remember cardiac tamponade decompression if indicated. If still the patient is not improving on volume, always treat that cardiac tamponade as one of the differentiation. Have blood ready if needed, level 1 infusers available. So there are a level 1 infusers that is rapidly you can infuse the fluid into the patient. If available, well and good, falling cathedral to monitor resuscitation. There are uh, different Categories of hemorrhagic shock that I have not discussed here because uh, primary you can have hemorrhagic shock itself is a different class. So you can have class 1, class 2, class 3 and class 4 hemorrhage. So class 1 and class 2 hemorrhage you can manage maybe with just an IV fluid. But beyond class 3 and class 4 you need a blood transmission. So hypotension will start in only by class 3. So for example in class 1 hemorrhagic shock we just have 75, 750 ml of blood loss. The patient might not have any symptoms rather than maybe a postural syncope. 750 to 1500 ml class 2 shock, the patient start developing some amount of tachycardia, narrowing of the pulse pressure and from class 3 and class 4 the patient will have hypertension, decrease your output, comatose, sensorium, everything is going to get affected, base excess is going to increase, all those things will be going to happen in class 3 and class 4 hemorrhagic shock. So depending upon that you can decide 
when the patient is presenting you with hypotension following your trauma, it means the patient is already in class 3. He has lost more than 1500 ml. That's one thing that you can remember. Immediately order for blood transfusion. So again, it is a balanced resuscitation that you need to keep in mind. Hypotensive resuscitation. The components of balanced resuscitation is one is balanced resuscitation. Massive transfusion protocol you need to activate. And sometimes a damaged glucose surgery also. So these are the requirements for balanced resuscitation. Already there is a video on it. So I am not discussing on balanced resuscitation at this point. And depending upon the patient response, you can have three categories of patient. You can have rapid responders. You have given a fluid, suddenly the blood pressure has improved. You have given a fluid, the, suddenly the blood pressure has improved. That is called as a rapid responders. Then there is a group of patients, no response at all. You have given fluid, there is no response to the pa patient's blood pressure. The BP is not improving. So they need to be immediately shifted to the OR for further exploration and hemorrhage control. And there is a second and third category of patient, there is a transient responders. So you just given fluid, he responded, you have gone into another patient assessment. By the time you are coming back here, this patient is again in hypertension. So this transient responders group is very tricky group of patients that you can easily miss. So these are the three group of patients that you need to keep in mind. Okay, so now uh, coming to neurological status, you need to have uh, a thorough neurological examination later on. But initially what you can do is GCS score. And you can look for the pupil size and reactivity and motor function. That is, quickly you can assess. And it is again utilized to determine the severity of the injury. Suppose this patient is having significant head injury, the GCS will be moderate, uh, my more severe head injury, GCS will be less than 8. So, lower score you can have is 3 for GCS and maximum score of 15 you can have. So, depending upon that, we can decide CT and ICP monitoring. We will discuss the uh, traumatic brain injury management separately. So, disability intervention, what all you have to do? Spinal cord injury, basic examination and neurology consultation, you need to keep in your mind. Steroids that you can do it in after your secondary assessment. ICP monitoring, again, secondary assessment, you can decide. Basic things, what you can do, head end of the patient to be elevated. Suppose you are having a severe traumatic brain injury patient, TBI, traumatic brain injury patient, head end to be elevated, roll of mantle of 3%, hyperventilation, not routinely indicated and emergent decompression. So we'll discuss TBA separately. So that time we can have each of these things discussed in detail. And uh, exposure and env environmental control, complete disrobing of the patient, log roll and inspect mark, warm trauma blankets and warm uh, uh, trauma bay, external warming devices should be available to prevent hypothermia. Reason I have already mentioned why. And resuscitation should be done simultaneously. Protect and secure airway, ventilate and oxygen, stop the bleeding, crystalline and blood transfusion, protect from hypothermia. So these are the Things that you need to do for A, B, C, C, and D, and E. So these are the things that you need to. This will be for E. This is for again for C. This is for E. Okay. So that is the resuscitation should be done simultaneously. Now uh, coming to the most important one of the bedside investigation that you can do is a focus assessment sonography in trauma. Suppose you have a patient in trauma. You can have the patient is unstable. What you can do is a quickly do a fast or stable or unstable patient, you are using your ultrasound probe and keeping it in four areas. One is in the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant. So that is the hepatorenal ports, renal ports and uh, around the urinary bladder that is in the pelvis and four in the cardiac area. And also you can keep in the lungs for your uh, to know whether there is any pneumothorax. So this is again to look for your cardiac thyroid in the epigastrium and you are looking for any free fluid that you are able to see. Suppose the patient is having a fast positive and he is unstable, this patient would go to the operation theatre, OR. And you have a stable patient but fast is negative, then you can have a serial fast or you can go ahead with CT. Suppose a stable patient positive, you can shift for a CT and then you can go for a definitive management. So fast, you can, we need to do it as a bedside investigation, focus assessment sonography in trauma for all trauma patient, polytrauma victim that is coming to the ED. Get a fast done depending upon the whether it is positive or negative, depending on the stable or unstable, you decide whether shift to the OR, whether shift to the theater. Always remember that if the patient is unstable, fast positive, they should go to the operation theater, not to the safety room. That is a mistake that we does usually, but uh, the surgeons wanted a definite diagnosis and they will push the patient to the CT and the CT room patient collapses. So the patient is unstable, he should go to the theater, not to a CT room. So now coming to the adjuncts to the primary survey. So what we have discussed is airway, breathing, circulation, disability and exposure assessment, how to be done. And what are the primary survey adjuncts that you need to add? One most important is the vital sign, blood gases, pulse oximeter and capnography if available, 
urinary and gastric catheter, if not contraindicated, monitor the urine output and then ECG. So these are the uh, basic adjuncts to the primary survey. I will not say pass as an adjunct to the primary survey. This is a part of the primary survey. So focus assessment sonography is here and third hand that you need to use for all the patients that is presenting you with trauma. So that is fast. Then adjuncts to the primary survey. This is again a chest X-ray. Uh, you are looking for a fast free fluid. You are able to see the black color here. So see able to see the black color here. That is the free fluid. Uh, then X-ray pelvis. So which all the X-rays that is needed? A chest X-ray, a P view to look for any fracture or pneumothorax, and a pelvis X-ray, a P view. No need of a cervical spine X-ray. So that is again not needed. So again, transfer to definitive care if the patient you don't have facility. Which patient do we transfer? When injury is exceeding your institutional capacity, you are overburdened with your capacity, you are not able to deal with this patient. Do not delay transfer for imaging. You want to do a CT, then shifting. Don't do that. If you are sure that you don't have a definitive care, immediately transfer the patient. Stabilize prior to transfer. That is again ABCD stabilization needed to be done. And medical legal responsibility is very, very important. Document all the injuries. We are lucky to have a clinical forensic medicine unit here where the clinical forensic medicine team take over and document all the injuries. We just need to take care of the stabilizing the patient. The CFM unit, which is uh, available in our hospital, will take care of all the uh, documentation purpose and all those things. They will help us in uh, filling up the forms and everything. So medical legal responsibility is very, very, very important. And decompensation should be anticipation. So anytime the patient can suddenly decompensate. So suppose the patient is stable at any moment of time, the patient can go wrong. And air ambulance transfer now it's slowly coming up in India also. Now we have done our primary survey. We have revaluated the patient, and you have made sure that the patient is stable for a secondary examination. Then you have to go for a complete history and physical examination, or what you can do is called as a sample history. So sample history, what do you mean by sample history? Signs and symptoms. Allergies, medications, anything, P is for pregnancy and any past illnesses, L is for last meal, and E is for events that brought in patient here. And head to toe examination, including a rectal examination, is ideally needed. And ABCD should be reassessed during that time. Vital pressure returning to, can be returning to normal. And if any diagnostic study is needed, you wanted an, any other extremities x ray or you wanted a CT, anything else, you can do at this point of time. So that is again ample history. I would say it is sample history. So sample history, A, allergies, M, medication, past illness. S is for signs and symptoms. That is I added on. But ATLS just go with ample history. Last meal and environments, even an environment that brought in the patient we are eating. So always, always, always reassess. And do not forget your ABCD approach. And uh, what is head to toe examination? You need to look in for something mnemonic that you can remember is DCAP ATLS. You can look for any deformities. Conditions, aberrations, penetrations, burns, tenderness, laceration, and swelling. So that is the mnemonic that you can remember is the DCAP BTLS. And additional imaging and labs, depending upon the requirement, plain radiograph, CT, MRI, standard lab investigation, whichever is needed that you can see. But remember that the one area the patient can decompensate is in your radiology department. So we are having to have a very good monitoring system available, and one trained person should be there with the patient if you think this patient is going to be unstable. Go to radiology if stable only. If the patient is unstable, shift to the definitive care. So examination again, uh, head and axial patient, you have to look for any bony crepitus, malocclusion, deformities, external examination, and pick this clap, eye and ear examination, which you have to do. This is just for the completion sake. And neck and soft tissue injuries, you need to look for any blunt versus penetrating injury, any airway obstruction, hoarseness. So this is the zone one, zone two injuries, what you can have in the neck. Look for any crepitus. You can have a uh, laryngeal fracture also. These all things you should be looking for. Just again, you inspect palpitus purpose hospital and you ask for the X-rays, which are is needed. And secondary survey, pelvis, plain on pain on palpation, you need to look in for leg length, unequality, instability, X-ray as and when needed. Look for any perineal hematoma, laceration, and urethral bed. Very, very important. Suppose you are going to miss a pelvic injury, you can have an urethral bed to start off with. Sphincter tone, high riding prostate, pelvic fracture, rectal wall integrity, blood in the vagina, all those things you can look in for. These are all what you can look in for. Secondary examination again, look for any confusion, pain, perfusion, uh, status of the patient, and x rays as and when needed. So spine again, palpate for the full spine tenderness, swelling. Whatever I have said, the DKP details. 
we can just put in every area whichever is available. That is deformity, conduction, abrasion, penetration, laceration, tenderness, any of these things. We have to check in these areas. So brain, look for GCS pupillar reaction. We can see, able to see a large, what do you can see? This is a large EDH that you are able to appreciate here. Sorry, SDH that you are able to see here. Then you have to go for the uh, spine x-rays if needed, but I don't prefer to doing a spine x-ray. We can straight away go with either a CT or MRI because in the x-ray room, they will just remove the cervical collar, the patient will be moving here and there. And if there is a stable fracture, by doing all those things, it will become unstable. So always, preferably go ahead with a CT or MRI whenever it is indicated. Again, uh, you need to examine for your extremities for pain, condition. So this all we have completed already. Now, yeah, to summarize uh, what we have concluded here. See, you understand the trying model death pattern. So the second peaking is what we are trying to prevent by doing an advanced trauma life support. Do not do further harm. That is a primum known serum that we have already learned. So do not do further harm to the patient. Do a proper stabilization. Do a proper cervical immobilization. Don't just shoot the patient just like you are holding one hand here and there. Don't do that. So train your uh, paramedical team. Paramedic, they might know maybe the auto rickshaw drivers. So whoever you are seeing that transporting the trauma victim, train them in those aspects. Proper pre-hospital care. Proper communication. You communicate that you are bringing a patient to your facility. Prevent missed injury. Reassess the patient. A, B, C, D approach always, always, always. So A is airway with cervical spine. B is breathing with ventilation and oxygenation. C is circulation with hemorrhage control. D is disability assessment. E is exposure. Prevent hypothermia and triage of death. You remember that. Treat greatest threat to the life first. That is why you are saying it is A, B, C, D. So a patient will die much before having a problem with B, problem with A. That is why A is moved behind up and B is second, C is next and D is next and E is next. And intervention should not be delayed. Do not delay it for answer. Suppose you don't have facility. We think, okay, I will take a CT scan and it will send the patient. Don't do that. Suppose there is a delay. Just straight away refer the patient to a center once he is stable for that. So, uh, thank you for uh, your patient listening. So, we have uh, concluded our discussion. So, remember A is for airway with cervical spine immobilization. B is for breathing and oxygenation. C is circulation with hemorrhage control, D is disability assessment, and E is exposure and prevention of hypothermia. Thank you.